Hello and welcome to episode 115 of The Dive Down, a Magic the Gathering podcast focused on the latest decks, trends, strategies, and streamers for the casual and aspiring spikes. My name is Stanislav here in Chicago, and with me on the line from Denver, Colorado, it's the one and only Shane Beeps. Look, let's just let's just skip me. Let's just skip the Godfather. Let's just go straight to the guy who matters. Also with us, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> you know it. The aspiring Spike joining us for a very special Sunday recording, Everett Mohan. Hi, guys. Hi, Everett. I'm glad to be back. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> It's 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 not even it's not even novel at this point. It's just it's the unofficial fourth host is we're <laughs> we're finally back in the rotation. But we have ever here for a really special reason tonight, Stan. And it's the Godfather, Dave Harburger. That's right. So Everett is here for a special reason. It's a special episode on multiple accounts. It's modern focused. This is another Patreon backed episode. This one was called out for us by uh, our. Uh, top, most top tier patron of all time, Bob. Majority stakeholder, Bob. Yeah, majority stakeholder in Dive Down LLC. A non-hostile takeover of tonight's show. Yeah, Bob is our our very talented and generous community tournament organizer. Yeah, one of one of our few. Yeah, Ben and and Bob putting together great tournaments. Bob's been doing stuff quite often across many different formats, including starting a legacy group with our, in our community, very active. And so just to make it special, you know, when, like we talked about last week, when you get to a tier in our Patreon, you get to select a deck for us to do a dive down on. And the deck that Bob selected necessitated us reaching out to our friend Everett and asking him if he would join us for this dive down because it's his deck. It's one of his decks. That's right. Bob asked us to do a deck dive into modern Bant Ephemerate, sometimes known as Bant Soul Herder, though there were none in our 75s. Is it a rogue strategy, an undervalued control shell, or maybe the most fun deck you've never played? Maybe after this episode, you'll decide. But before that, we're going to take a quick look through the latest edition of Historic Anthology hitting Arena this week, probably by the time this episode comes out, maybe the same day as this episode comes out. First, though, we got to get to everyone's favorite segment, and that's housekeeping. Shout out to the newest patrons to join the Dive Down Nation, David S., Rick V., and Caleb M. Welcome, and thank you. Also, shout out to Odin E. for going up a tier in their patronage. All, always means the world to us. Thank you, Odin. And there's more. We have a couple new reviews. Endo Ice and Jack Legroni. That's my favorite cocktail. Yeah. And Jack Legroni. It's so <laughs> so nice on a on a summer night. You know, Jack Jack Daniels, lemon, and uh, Campari. Yeah, Campari. delicious. Yeah, people, people think it's kind of bitter, but it's actually like really sweet and terrifying. Bourbon and bourbon and Campari. I don't. Is that a real drink? Is that a is that a Boulevardier? That's a yeah. It's like a it's like whiskey Negroni. It's, it's it's surprisingly good. Surprisingly good. I didn't think it was gonna be. I kind of want to try that now. Once I turn twenty one, that is. <laughs> That was a fun housekeeping. Uh, we don't usually get to shout out so many people. So thanks to everyone to join the nation, go up a tier, and for leaving us reviews. Yeah, speaking of the nation, you want to join the Dive Down Nation, join the awesome community of folks we have on the Super Secret Slack server. As little a, as a buck a week, you uh, help support, keep us going, help us support what we're doing here at the Dive Down. I just sent out uh, a bunch of Patreon swag uh, packages. Stan set out some of our uh, Patreon special uh, play mats that Dave uh, designed a few months ago. They are awesome. Uh, we have we're, we're low on stickers, so that means we get to make new stickers for uh, the newer nice. three dollar and up uh, patrons. So all sorts of cool stuff for you to get. Uh, most importantly, you get to join, like I said, the super secret Slack server uh, where things are always awesome. The best community of magic players uh, that I know of, besides perhaps aspiring spikes, uh, Twitch stream. I just want to say really quick, if we have to make new stickers and there are stickers you want to have made, send us an email. If you have an idea for what you would like to have on the sticker sheet, you know, right now it says things like casual spike. There's a sticker that says unbanned top you cowards. Uh, I don't remember all of the other ones. They're, they're a couple years old at this point, but if you have things you would like to see on a sticker, I'll make you a sticker. I, I will say even beyond that, everyone, if there is something you would like to get, have on a tier on the Patreon, <laughs> tell, tell Dave, you want a hat, tell us you want a hat. <laughs> 
you know I want to give make hats, but all joking aside, if you have an idea of something you want us to make, shoot us an email. I'm open to ideas. Um, we're open to I- any kind of ideas at this point. Can we do Aspiring Spikes chat emotes as stickers? Oh, uh, we man. have to license oh, them from him. Oh, man, a tie-in. But anyway, uh, if, if you want to do any of the stuff we just talked about uh you head on over to patreon.com slash the dive down all one word the all one word part is just me explaining if there's no spaces you don't type in all one word unless you really want to and then maybe like the those weird hackers that are trying to steal our patreon dollars you'll go to them instead anyway um do your worst we appreciate all of you out there yeah and if you want to support us while you're playing arena check out uh, untap.thedivedown.com to download uh, untap.gg's excellent stat buddy program. And we get a little kickback every time you download. Appreciate your support. All right. Now I'm going to toss it back to Shane. You're on the news desk this week uh, doing a consumer report for uh, Magic Consumer <laughs> Reports magazine. Yeah. So Magic Consumer Reports magazine um, if, if you don't, if you don't subscribe to it, you probably go to your local, uh, library website and, you know, log in and you get access. So ever, I'm not going to put you on blast here, but I have a question. Sure. So we were just talking about how Frazier was a little before your time. Can <laughs> I, can I ask you a question? Have you ever subscribed to a print edition of a magazine? Uh, when I was a kid, I subscribed to Game Informer. I loved, loved, loved when I got a Game Informer every, every month. I also subscribed to the Bionicles comic book when I was a kid. <laughs> and I remember I was really invested in one, of, in one of the arcs. And then there was a flashback that lasted like two, you know, in real life years. And I stopped reading. I was oh, really, really upset. Rude. Lost in the middle. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you know, magazine subscriptions dying out. I still get wired somehow. Do you really? And I get the fictitious magic magazine that Shane just brought up. So I'll yes. just t- tie it back. So uh, this past week, Watsi published an article on the mothership announcing the fourth historic anthology, which people have been waiting for and expecting. It's going to hit Arena on March 11th, 2021, which also means the real world. Uh, so what you might ask are these anthologies if you're not uh, a storied historic player, if you aren't too invested in arena. Well, the anthologies are basically ways for Watsi to directly insert cards into the historic format on arena. They're immediately craftable with wild cards or the entire bundle of cards can be purchased with 4,000 gems, which is about 20 bucks if you buy $100 of gems at once or 25,000 gold, which is basically about $25 worth of gold. Is that one of each card or four? You get of each the card? you get four. Four. So it's, you get a hundred cards, basically. I think more or less, like a hundred cards. Pretty good. Yeah. I mean, so it's a, it's it's good value in terms of that. But I think that's actually uh, an interesting conversation we'll have about the relative value uh, of what this is in a minute. Um, the first one of these anthologies, if you can believe it, was released on November twenty first, twenty nineteen, which was actually right when historic became a thing too. They were just like, hey, uh, you're getting historic. You're also going to get these 20 new cards. Um, And the idea was to expand the format in potentially interesting ways. And Anthology 1 was pretty cool. It had like some nostalgic cards, some build around cards, some tools for existing decks. Like you got like, you know, Sarah Asena and Soul Warden, like these modern Soul Sisters staples. So like, was there a Soul Sisters life gain type deck in an historic Goblin Matron, this tutor for the Goblin decks that's still in place, Burning Tree Emissary. We all know how good she is for being an awesome mana ramp creature in, in gruel style decks or even mono red at times. Mindstone, Colorless Ramp, you know, major staple there. And, you know, some other cards that you know, were more or less valuable. But an, an interesting note that Watsi made in this first announcement back in November of 2019 was new card drops were planned every quarter. And we'll, we can look at the cadence of these releases and uh, make a judgment for ourselves on how they have been able to stick to that schedule. So you're you're thinking that there's some room for judgment in whether they stuck to it once a quarter. Well, or I, I think there's I think it's objective. I don't think it's judgment. <laughs> I think it's objective. Uh, so anthology two came out in March 2020. Added 25 new cards. Um, I'm just going to hit some highlights like Thalia, Waste Knot, 
Mero Regery, Meddling Mage, Maelstrom Pulse, The Cycling Lands, Ghost Quarter. Anthology 3 was uh, two months later in May. Uh, we got like Ulamog, Phyrexian Obliterator, Timely Reinforcements, Ratchet Bomb. Kind of a weird graveyard flashback theme I don't think did much, like Unburial Rites and Momentary Blink and Silent Departure, stuff like that. I mean, this is still a lot of playable cards on this mm-hmm. list that, that you're sharing, especially, you know, there's some definitive cards in here like Burning Tree Emissary that's been on and off the ban list and Soul Warden is important. And so there's, there's a lot of good cards cards on this list. Oh, yeah. That's been the cool thing about it, I think, is we've had cards that either ostensibly had some chops, like Meddling Mage, I've actually never seen cast in Historic, uh, but is a modern card, of course, in Modern Humans, and maybe some other kind of like maybe Azorius Taxes style decks that we see quite a bit. But uh, Anthology 4 was apparently kind of delayed. They released those first three anthologies in the span of six months, but then Watsi took nearly 10 months to package the fourth. And I think people's evaluation on what the fourth is looking like and its impact on the format, the, the jury's kind of out, so to speak. And so what I think we should do is, is take a look at those. Everett, have you looked at this list before? I know you kind of keep one eye on, on historic, but... I haven't looked at the whole list, but my Twitch chat has sent me the interesting cards i think ah. yeah twitch chat is good at keeping at, at asking you things and keeping you moderately That's where aware I get all of my news yeah yeah so this is this is another spot where you know everett's gonna be able to tell people in his chat to go to minute 12 of the yeah. dive down this week to hear what he <laughs> thinks about the cards that are coming into historic it's a win-win see win-win he doesn't have to spend his time on his chat talking about it exactly he will though I probably will. Can't huh? get away from it. It's like, yeah, you, you spend double the time, if not triple. <laughs> yeah. So let's well, let's quickly go over the cards that are actually in Anthology 4, and we'll go through Wooberg, uh, Gall, that's gold artifacts and lands, if you're not in the mm. know. So What's the U in Wooberg? Blue. I don't know why. I mean, I know why. So white, we have Adorned Pouncer. Okay, I'm not going to explain any of these cards because I want to test your knowledge, listeners at home about how many of these you're gonna know on the fly. White, Adorned Pouncer, Declaration in Stone, Thraben Inspector, Triumphant Reckoning. Blue, Iceberg, Iceberg, Cancric, shout out to one patron, uh, Craig. Uh, Merit Lage of Slumber, and Think Twice. Black, Amit Eternal, Death's Shadow, what's uh, that, is that a card? Faith of the Devoted, Torment of Scarabs, Red, Flame Blade Adept, Goblin Gavalier, and Harmless Offering, Green, Lee's Alana, Huntmaster, Saw Tusk, Demolisher, Spider Spawning, Gold, Hamza, Guardian of Arishin, Collected Conjuring, Abomination of Lanawar, Artifacts, Bone Splitter, Cold Seal Heart, Inspiring Statuary, Sword of Body and Mind, and Lands, Blink Moth, Nexus. So I personally could tell you probably what, like 11? of these cards sort of generally did without looking like I might not know the exact CMC. I know what they do, but 14 of them. I was, was, no idea. I probably cast like maybe six of these cards. Like what, what, what's your general response to like this list of cards? I kind of think that it's cool that I, as an enfranchised magic player also don't know every single one of them, but as I like kind of, uh, go and, and look at, uh, google them as uh, shane reads them i can definitely see like the thought process behind printing them so it kind of feels like there's something for more enfranchised players to discover something new that they, that they never got to cast before and you know new players also seeing new old cards spike all you gotta do is click that scryfall link i put up there in those notes oh wow i've been googling each one individually <laughs> oh no i'm i'm here i'm here for you my friend thank you this is so much better but um yeah, Dave, Stan, any initial response to this list of cards? It's a list of cards. Why did white get four cards? That's not fair. White got four cards. Black got four cards. Notably overpowered. They, yeah, they yeah. need to nerf white. It's too good. <laughs> yeah, and as we all know, Adorned Pouncer is really going to make the difference <laughs> here. I think the general community sentiment has not been overly positive about this list of cards in Anthology 4. I, I think they should be. By the way, like, like let's look. I, I think that there's enough here to be worth it, but let's let's go through the list. Yeah. So what I thought we should do um, is I made a list of kind of the the things that I think would have a potential 
impact on the format. And I'm sure that uh, I have, you know, my own, my own little view, like, and so I might be missing some things. So if there's anything that I don't have on this list, feel free to, to call out. But I think let's just, let's, instead of burying the lead, let's start with the banger of Death Shadow. And you probably know what Death Shadow does. Single black mana for a 13-13. That seems really good. Uh, uh, Death Shadow gets minus X minus X, where X is your life total. So you basically have to have your life total at, what, 12? How does that work? I always figure out figure how this works. You have to have, you have, to have yeah, 12 or less. That's a good place to start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't play it as a one one. Well, uh, as someone who's cast Death Shadow, yeah. with higher than twelve life, you know it doesn't it doesn't stop you state from, based effects from, from casting doing it. it. That's right. I, I wonder if Arena will have a little like window. Are you sure? Are you? Are you sure? <laughs> they might. Do you want to sacrifice Death Shadow to its um, own ability? Yeah. By the way, uh, picking up on last week's theme a little bit if you play merfolk trickster on this it becomes a 13 13 don't forget that it doesn't kill it like it does with scourge <laughs> it makes there's it... also a new there's a new blue enchantment that gives minus two minus so and loses all abilities which is another uh, another combo oh, man interesting so yeah so all your future uh demir death shadow players and historic keep those in mind so this this probably is the highest potential power level of a card we have here but i think what we need to talk about is if you know you can get your life total down quickly enough in Historic to get Shadow online efficiently enough. And if there's enough other support in this kind of general archetype or, you know, theory crafted archetype to make it a real thing. So we got a bunch of stuff in this in Historic right now that can do it. We have Thoughtseize. We have multi, uh, we have the mythic double face lands. We the have bolt sh- lands. shock lands. Yeah, bolt lands, shock lands. We don't have fetches. That's the important thing. We don't have fetches. That is important. We we have bind the stuff like bind the monster which does some damage to you. Let me ask you this, Everett, what do you think it takes really to make Death Shadow good? Like how how much support does it take to make it a playable card, especially in a format that also has scourge? It's hard to say for sure. The fact that you also have scourge is a big deal. Um, you know, I've played Death Shadow decks without uh, Street Wraith and kind of found it relatively easy to turn online. And I think that if you play like four of the black bolt lands and four of the red ones and four blood crypts, uh, you're probably going to be able to get Death Shadow going. But when you ask what does it take to make Death Shadow a good card, I actually don't think the answer is necessarily enablers that you're paying life to. Uh, more, mostly because just most formats have that. What I actually think makes Death Shadow a good card is efficient one-mana interaction. And so the density of one-mana discard spells, Inquisition and Thoughtseize, the density of one-mana removal spells, you know, maybe Fatal Push and Lightning Bolt in your deck. The real power behind Death Shadow is you have all these efficient one-mana interactive spells, and then you also get to play a really, really efficient one-mana threat. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, you know, Historic does have Thoughtseize, but I'm not sure if it lacks the density of cheap interaction for death shadow to shine can 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 you actually help bridge that gap for me i i'm not sure i follow like the specific logic like because death shadow is a one mana creature you're incentivized to play a lower curve with cheap interaction sure When, when your threat is one mana when your best threat is one mana you don't need to have expensive spells in your deck and and you're incentivized to make your cheap threat as good as possible by just one for wanting one for wanting one for wanting and then playing your one mana threat and if your one for ones cost two or three mana, they're going to be slower to happen because they, they cost more mana, and you're actually going to have to play more lands in order to trade resources with your opponent. But if you can trade resources uh, for one mana or as cheaply as possible, and then your threat is one mana compared to their threats, which are two, three, four, that's how you gain your advantage with Death Shadow because you're, you're investing less on your threats, and because you've exchanged resources. Uh, your threat is more efficient than theirs. Is a big part of uh, how how these like grindy Death Shadow games play out. I know I don't know if that was a good explanation. No, that's a great but, explanation yeah. for sure. I mean, it's interesting to see the pieces that are here and that aren't right. Like there isn't great. There aren't a lot of cantrips, for example, like great can't great cheap cantrips available in the format. That's something that Death Shadow needs. There is like only a medium amount of one mana interaction. Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of the conversation I want to get at. Right? Is like we're not going to recreate a hyper efficient death shadow deck i think in historic but can something like a the hyper efficiency of rakdos arcanist sort of pivot itself to say 
after you run me out of all sorts of stuff, after like you've gotten through my Scourge of the Skyclaves and I've ground you out with Thoughtseize and my Kroxa, like is for Death Shadow adding enough to the deck that it's going to replace something else? Like maybe it's no longer like a, a Pyromancer deck and you have instead a Death Shadow or maybe be pivots and become something more aggressive where it's like, hey, I have Gitu Lava Runner and Scourge of the Skyclaves and a bunch of Bolt Lands and Shock Lands. Or maybe even something like a, a whole new archetype where it's like Grixis or Mardu and you're running something like a Danto Vanguard to increase the aggressiveness while also getting your life total low. Or maybe like a Grixis deck where it's like I have Drown in the Lock and other kind of counter magic and I'm playing a tempo game where in the end I have the you know six six one mana spell or something like that. You know, we keep trying to pair Death Shadow with Scourge because I think that's the precedent precedent set by modern. Yeah. But I actually don't find Scourge the potential for Scourge as high in historic because we don't have a fetch shock based mana base at the heart of the format. So I think like Scourge is a much bigger liability because you're not pressuring life totals, you know, in the current red black mid range decks in historic the way you are. I think kind of just naturally benefiting from the fact that Scourge is often a two mana three three in modern. Yeah, that's that's one thing that I that's why I brought up kind of like G2 Lava Runner as like a sort of how do we make it from being a it's a grindy deck right now, right? Where like you're not always pressuring life totals. So you can have a stranded you don't want eight cards that can be stranded in your hand, right? Um so how do you how do you modify the deck to fit both of them in? Is a, is a good point, Stan. I will say this. I think that when Claim Fame was printed originally, uh, Luis, uh, you know, LSV had said this is one of the best cards in the set. It's going to be insane in Death Shadow decks. I think I think this is going to be the spot where it actually gets to shine next to Death Shadow for, for once. I mean, Claim Fame is already good in Historic, in Arcanist and things like that, but I think it'll be even better with the ability to pull uh, Death Shadow or Scourge out of the graveyard. Yeah, exactly. Like, let's imagine you're playing like a Stitcher Supplier type strategy and you're already leveraging Claim so well there, but now it's just kind of like Death Shadow is stranded in my graveyard, which is fine. Like, I can get this sort of back and be a 6-6 six, six or 7-7 seven, seven super efficiently late game. I mean, I'm excited for it to be there. I think a lot of people have some trepidation about it being almost too good in the format. I'm just curious to see where it goes. I mean, it's I think it's a powerful card, of course, and it it incentivizes a certain kind of deck building that I don't think quite exists in Historic right now. So it'll be cool to see if it, uh, if it turns out. I don't know if it's going to be good. I mean, there's so many wide decks in Historic. Like, just thinking about this, like, in the theoretical Angels matchup or something like that, I'm like, eh, you know, there's so, so there's a lot of decks that I feel like go against that. That's a good point, Dave. So, where I'll push back a little bit is, because of Death Shadow being in the format, you're potentially incentivized to play blue for something like Bind, or uh, just stay in black for Feed the Swarm. And, like, Feed the Swarm just gets everything in Angels, and I think also feeds your Shadow in a really profitable way. So, I, I'm not sure... Like, I immediately agree that, like, Angels is going to be a poor matchup because, in a way, it makes some of your conditional removal stronger. The condition being you have to pay life. I think the point's important, Dave, that you made, which is just, like, we don't have a deck like this in Historic. So let's see if this deck can be a thing. Or mm. if Death Shadow can just sort of be an ancillary, like, threat in a just a normal kind of deck where it can eventually be cast. And I think those are both cool things. I doubt it will be overpowered, um, but I think it, we'll see if it... I'm, I'm curious if it can even be a legitimate threat. So we'll see. I think it's cool. One thing to keep in mind is that they're probably not too scared of it with Fatal Push and uh, Blood Chief's Thirst in the format, too. So there's there are some cards that kind of help you out if it does get out of hand. And the uh, Tiber Battle Rage is not, not a thing. Historic legal, right? Correct. Yeah. There's not okay. one. You got to play like Barge In and Crash Through or the Royal Scions. Yeah. All right, let's All move right. on to the next card. This is one that I think people have been wanting uh, some kind of Path to Exile replacement in Historic, especially after it got cut out of the arena version of Jumpstart. And now we're one step closer with Declaration in Stone. One in a white four sorcery, exile target creature, and all other creatures its controller controls with the same name as that creature. Then that player investigates for each non-token creature exiled this way. Which basically means make a clue 
and a clue is a what an artifact that you can pay two mana to sacrifice to draw and card. draw a card. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have to tap it? I think you sacrifice uh, you do it. Not. So. Yeah. Does Karn shut that down? Karn does shut that yeah. down. Yeah. Yes. So that's a combo right there. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, a Karn bell. Stop the presses. I forgot about that. <laughs> All right. So I don't think we have to go too, too deep on Declaration, but I do think this is a reasonable card to have in a format that doesn't have access to Path or Winds of Abandon, which I think is what people were actually hoping yeah, I th- to, yeah. to have here. We- but Wings is so safe. I think Wings would have been perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I've, we've been on record, I think, on this pod that Wings is probably historic, safe, pioneer safe. Yeah, but I like I like Declaration in Stone. I've played it. I played it in Standard at the time that, that that was going on. It's a fine removal spell. It's a fine removal spell that exiles. So we'll see. I, I will say that Declaration in Stone, I played a lot of that Standard. Never felt very good in any control deck. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I don't think this is something you would want in like a, a Bant uh, control deck if people still play that, but... Yeah, I mean, yeah. something to look at, and you're like, you're maybe your green white angels deck will really like this. Yeah, I mean, if you look at like, it might be something out of the board for really tricky things too, because one mm-hmm. of the popular, t- you know, the popular two mana removal spells in white are uh, baffling end and seal away, like yes. that kind of stuff, and those have conditions, right, that you can get around with with uh, declaration, and of course, declaration has that upside of the uh, the same name as that creature mm-hmm. part too, so you get a little bit extra bonus there if you can. So I think this is like an option in the removal suite. Yeah, it's an option. It's just like the the giving an opponent the clue is a fairly significant drawback, I think. I mean, it's not instant replace, right? But it still is not great. It's just crazy to look at Declaration and be like, this card might be something, but it was it was printed five years ago, right? Like Shadows yeah. is five years old. The power level of our like sort of exile based enchantment removal type stuff has has been su- surprisingly decent and it wasn't great when it was around so i mean i'd like it to add to the white removal suite but i don't know i think it might be extremely marginal well i wish it wasn't i, w- I wish to fairy time reveler, reveler was still legal in the format so you can cast this or source rate instant speed I'm, I'm not sure better. if I agree with the first part, but I wish that this was instant. Yeah. All right. Next card. Thraven Inspector. One white for a one, two. That makes a clue when it comes into, uh, when it comes to the battlefield investigates. Uh, I think this card is, is good. You know, I think it's a good option to have at one mana. I don't think it's like a, an insanely great card, but I do think that there are some decks that would want this, whether they want an artifact for some reason, whether they just want to have value. I even think that there's a white weenie deck that I've played against a couple of times that would probably run this, run this card without really thinking about it too much. So I just feel like it's a solid card. It's playable. Inspector is great. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> the card is so, so good in my opinion. I, I feel like it's a very good card without a very good home in historic. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it's not it's not going to be in Selesnia Angels. It's not going to be in Selesnia Company. It's not going to be in Auras. Like, it's, it exists in something like Pioneer. In like an, there's an Orzhov Humans deck that's, like, sort of on the fringes of playability. and But that has so many more, like, human support, right? And we don't, yeah. we don't have so many of those cards in, in Historic right now. So I think that as Pioneer grows, excuse me, as Historic grows, let's just get through this. Uh, Shane forgets what these formats are named again. As as historic grows, I think that Thraben will find more homes, and in, and she's a great creature to have access to. I think for the long term. So eventually, I imagine that Sh- uh, Shadows Block will will exist in in uh, historic. But for now, we can uh, use her to be finding stuff uh, in the alleyways. Very specific image there, but. <laughs> Is that where, where the three wood inspector found the tiny Eldrazi? Yeah, she's totally in an alleyway. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right, let's move on. Next card, Flameblade Adept. Single red for a 1-2 menace. When you cycle or discard a card, Flameblade Adept gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn. This is probably the best card in the list with the least amount of support, yeah, in my opinion. Exactly. Totally agree. Yeah. I mean, like, 
I think like you can look at this along with like Faith of the Devoted, although I don't think that Faith of the Devoted is going to do a lot. And that's a two and a black enchantment that when you cycle or discard a card, you can pay a, sing a generic mana. If you do, each opponent loses two life and you gain two life. So you see what they're trying to go for here. Like, hey, like maybe there's a cycling or discard theme here. Um, Flame is really cool and might ex might kind of make an historic cycling shell like kind of a thing. Like maybe not exactly a discard shell because we haven't really even had a modern discard shell since we've lost Faithless Looting, I think. Um, the support's just not exactly there. It's not far off in modern, though, just yeah. because of Burning Inquiry, which is just always, you know, still there right now. But I, I've been I've been playing against Flame Blade Adept Hollow One in modern recently really? a few times. And it, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't look that bad. Nice. Is it that like Burgey deck with Breach, uh, Underworld Breach? No, I, I have seen that one, but uh, they play like Ox of Ognas to kind of like refuel in the mid game mm -hmm. and they're kind of a grindy grindier version of the old hollow one deck yeah sweet yeah. i mean that's the kind of stuff i'd love to see be a thing bring it here and like we we have cathartic reunion and historic we have ox of agonis as well we have thrill know? of possibility which i sometimes is a card that i like as far as that goes we almost had goblin lore because it's in jump start <sighs> why not but they did not add, put not it into that? there i mean i know it kind of sucks right like yeah it's too bad um so but i mean what this really does is it adds like a one drop threat to a cycling deck alongside Flourishing Fox. And so it, that mm -hmm. can replace some kind of like marginal cycling threats at the, it, oh, that's a at really the good two point, CMC yeah. spot, right? And I mean, but of course, there's like a lot of pros and cons to Adept versus Fox. Like one, Adept has Menace, which makes it like an effective early attacker, but it doesn't gain toughness even with the triggers and can be blocked. Like it could be double blocked, which is like probably fine. Like you're probably going to get a maybe a two for one there. But what Fox does, it just grows and grows and grows and then can like attack with impunity, can stay back and block if it needs to. It keeps its gains. So like there's definitely a space for both of those and why not both? Um, so I think that it's it's a thing that could maybe be something fun to mess with, but I, I'm not sure that Flame Blade, Flame Blade Adept like suddenly turns anything into a legitimate deck and historic that wasn't there before but we'll see yeah we'll see it's a one mana creature that can get really big i think that that's enough to keep it on the radar right on. all right next card blink moth nexus tap add a colorless one colorless to activate it to turn it into a one one artifact with flying until end of turn it still land or you can pay a generic and tap it to give target blink moth creature plus one plus one until end of turn yeah this card I don't know. I think it's a reasonable value card. It's, it's interesting to have it in a format where you don't have access to Muta Vault, you mm -hmm. know, but you do have access to Faceless Haven, which is a card that I've been keeping an eye on recently and thinking that was pretty good. But this is a lot cheaper and it's evasive, but it's a lot less impactful. So I don't know how this fits into the picture there, but it's, it's nice. It's nice to have. Like, I feel like there's probably some some deck that might want it for the artifact synergy at some point. Yeah, Steel Overseer, uh, Toolcraft Exemplar, pretty powerful, aggressive creatures that want artifacts. Uh, one, one notable thing about uh, Thraven Inspector 2 is that Toolcraft Exemplar is legal now, and those two cards always played really well together. Good point. And I could yep. definitely see Blink Moth slotting well into an artifact uh, matters aggro deck. We have Tempered Steel in Historic. Also from an anthology, so yeah. Sorry, when, when I was testing for the last PT, I I had a a, a white based artifact aggro deck that I really liked, and uh, this would have been really nice, especially with tempered steel. What's that plow? What's that plow from the the from Kaldheim? Is that does that fit into oh, this deck too? Colossal plow. Colossal plow. <laughs> Are we building Maybe it right pulled, here? Pulled right by now? Ox of Agonis. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of easy to be like. Well, what's Blink Moth Nexus going to do in this format? And I think that there is probably more opportunity for it to be a thing mm -hmm. than we kind of initially give it credit for. Um, I mean, it's 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 been a thing in modern for a while. It was a, a major part of uh, and uh, modern affinity. So don't sleep on Blink Moth Nexus. But uh, I am curious about the next piece of artifactness, which is sort of body and mind. Equipped creature gets, I'm going to read this for you because you probably don't know what body and mind does because it kind of stinks. Uh, it gets plus two, plus two, has protection from green and from blue. Whenever the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, you create a two, two green wolf creature token. So get your green wolf creature tokens ready. And that player mills 10 cards. Um, yeah, sort of body and mind is not one of the better 
swords, but it still is an sword. I know it's a sword. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and swords are broadly okay, right? But like, is this going to do anything? Like, would you even have this on like a Karn wishboard? Probably not. I don't know. Yeah, you bring it in against Gruul. Yeah, please. Yeah, I, I don't think I'd expect Sword of Body and Mind to make a big impact or really be very playable at all, honestly. Yeah. It's not that there, great. What What's that Primal Might? Is that a card? Yeah, that's like mm-hmm. a that fight, card, fight card. Very good fight card. A rare fight card, which tells you how good Watsy thinks it is. So there you go. That's This will save you from getting blown out by a Primal mm. Might. <laughs> well, no, I mean, protection from green... Would the creature that they 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 cast Problemite on would have to be green or blue? Well, it's Spellbreaker, so. Yeah, I mean, you're always going to do it on Spellbreaker, right? <laughs> or, or Questing Beast. I mean, look, the only card I feel like we might be glossing over here is Inspiring Statuary, which is a three three generic that get, uh, artifact. It's a it's a poly artifact or whatever. No, what do they used to call it when it was just a had a static ability? Mono artifact. I don't remember anymore. <laughs> uh, it's, it just says non-artifact spells you cast have improvised. So there might be something there with some artifact synergies to um, to be able to help you ramp out some giant spells if you can get a bunch of cheap artifacts out there. It's just a card that I think people might have an eye on for combo pieces, but there's obviously way more powerful combo pieces from called High, or from uh, from Kaladesh, including things like uh, Paradox Engine and stuff like that. So. I'm surprised you didn't call out Merit Lage's Slumber. I think that's a card with a ton of potential, too, because well, we now have Snowlands and other Snow Permanents. Are you just going to rehash our Modern Horizons one set where we're we'll like, hey, this could be a thing. Don't for, don't forget this exists. Boy, do I think that card is bad. <laughs> really? Oh, uh, man. Even yeah, in yeah, yeah. I think that, I, yeah, I think it's two mana do nothing. I don't know. It's I, I know it. I, I, I don't know. This, <laughs> it's a two it's mana like a for, uh, I don't know, man. It's a hard sell for me. It, it is funny that they threw it in here with with Cold Steel Heart. So it's like if you were going to try to like get some snow artifacts out there and ramp some mana and stuff, I, you could see them being like, "Hey, check out this little theme we've got for you." Um, Speaking of Cold Steel Heart, while we're on the topic, mm-hmm. there's that colorless ramp deck mm-hmm. in historic. Oh, yeah. That that always wants to draw Mindstone. Yeah. When it draws Mindstone, it's like it looks like a real deck, <laughs> but you only get to play four Mindstones. But now you get to play eight Mindstones because you have Cold Steel Heart. So I, mean, I could sort of see like Mindstone, that right? doing something. Yeah, it, it's much worse. <laughs> it's much worse. But that deck really wants to have that just the two mana ramp spell on turn two, and you only got to play Mindstone before. And now you also get Cold Steel Heart. So maybe you don't play four. Maybe play like two or three. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I could see the card doing something. And it's a good point. I mean, it is a commander staple as far as I know. Mm-hmm. So maybe it's maybe it's a thing in historic as well. Last card I would want to just throw out real quick, because I know it's one that Stan probably looked at for a minute. Think twice. No, no, <laughs> it, it, we, don't, we don't like think twice anymore in any format, even well, one that's that's this this quote unquote lower power. We have frantic inventory. Yeah, I think Think Twice as time has passed as much as I do like the card. Like we have that. We also have the the card with jumpstart from yeah. guilds. That's definitely the that card that called. I was trying to figure out. That one's called inspiring something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think Frantic Inventory is gonna be replacing Think Twice in any in, reasonable or, or place. In any any deck like this. And I can't really imagine a deck that wants both and, and Shark Typhoon and or Shark Typhoon, you know. Before we move on into the dive down, what is, what's your overall thoughts on this historic anthology? And I'm gonna I'm gonna do the, the bad interview technique of also asking you the follow up question: Is what do you think Watsi should be doing with anthologies, if not this? I think this is fine. Honestly, I think there's like six playable cards in here. You're gonna get sets of all of them, given the way how much arena costs to play. I, I don't think twenty five bucks for the whole set is too bad. Uh, at least you know what you're going to get out of it. Unlike when you buy booster packs and you end up with other stuff. So, but I think there's enough cards in here that would cost you rare wild cards that I'm going to buy it. So even just to get four blink moth nexus as a hedge, as part of that for the future, like that's a significant amount of the 25 bucks, I think. Yeah. I think it's, it's, you want to talk about this financially. I think it, if you want to look at wild cards as six packs or 6,000 gold, um, then 
you can say like, well, if I'm going to craft one place out of these, that's like effectively 24,000 gold. I mean, you do get 24 other rares and other cards, right? But yeah, 20 of them are bad. Yeah, I mean, I think 18 I think of them are you bad. You can probably make the argument like even maybe eight cards is probably worth just buying instead of trying to you know spend your wilds on so like if you want eight of these like if you want four blink moth or four flame blades or four thravens and four death shadows and you're probably sort of just priced into just buying it i think i also don't want to understate you can also spend gold you you can grind to the point where you just buy these and that's not even that big of a grind like i think if you you can probably average you can probably get this like in if you were at zero like you could probably have this like in four what three weeks four weeks maybe like just just get the twenty five thousand gold and be done yeah but i think this is a fine thing i mean there's less splashy cards in this one than there are in the other ones but i still feel like i'm here i'm playing or i'm playing arena now i'm gonna spend my twenty five thousand to to get this and just kind of go on my way do you do you think that the anthologies should be better? And like by better, I just mean kind of like we know these cards will be good. And like I, I feel like if historic is just historic is almost like a lark of a format in some ways, right? Like I feel like historic could be an experimentation like area. It could be just like hey, we're going to be pretty dynamic with the suspension list and the ban list. Like give people more power. Right. And like people will spend more wilds, they will spend more gold, they will spend more gems, they will have more cool cards to play with. And then you can just suspend them or ban them later and people get their wild cards back. And that's like a win win, I think, for everyone. Like that's kind of like my devil's advocate here. Like why is why not just push it a little bit harder? I, I don't think that I would like to see it pushed harder. I I think I the I for someone who would be really invested in historic and really liking the landscape for a set like anthologies, which are random and unpredictable to just come in and, and totally change the landscape of historic by adding a staple or two. I, I don't think that that would be a good thing. So having like interesting, fun, flexible archetype role players like this, I think is, is a better way to go where like, a lot of these cards will spit it, fit in specific decks without being just absolute staples that you'll see every single game. Yeah, I think we've got to be careful with, you know, expecting Watsy to print must-purchase products. And I, I feel like that's kind of what you're getting at, Everett, is like, if it's too yeah. strong and everyone has to has it, A, it might homogenize the format, where it's like everyone's just playing anthology decks against one another. And B, I think if something gets banned, that becomes like uh, an epic feel-bad where like you had to have it to keep up and then it gets banned in your investment. I mean, you get wild and, cards and, banned, and but formats are better when the power level is level, you know, across the field. And that's never completely possible, but the more level the power field, the power level across all of your available cards and options, the better your format is. So, um, it's, it's very easy to print lower power level cards, uh, in, uh, compared to overpowered cards. And so I'd like to see them err on the side of caution. Sounds great. All right. That was a fun historic anthology conversation. Let's take a quick break because I'm eager to jump into our deck dive of the week um, and tap into as much of Everett's brain as we can while we have him. So when we return, we are diving into modern Bant ephemerate control blink fun deck. Stay with us. And we're back. So, you know, we like to start off our deck dives with a little bit of deck history. And this deck isn't really that old. It's, it's really only existed since Modern Horizons came out in the summer of 2019. Or was it 2018? No, it was 20, 2019. 19, yeah. Yeah. Um, and because of that, I wrote most of this history from the hip. So while I go through it, Spike or co-hosts, feel free to correct me. I think I remember it pretty vividly because I was there, but maybe maybe I missed something. Bant Ephemerate. In my mind, this deck totally owes its existence to everyone's favorite direct to modern format, Modern Horizons 1, which not only introduced the namesake card to the format, Ephemerate, but also contributed several other pieces that have come and gone throughout this deck's existence. The original version of the deck 
if memory serves, I think is credited to Gabriel Nassif, who put together a Bant shell with Ephemerate and Soul Herder, and then a bunch of powerful ETB cards, many of which we'll actually talk about today. Is that fair? Or, Spike, are you going to try to take credit for the, the heart of the deck? No, no, I, that, that's my understanding as well. Uh, I know the first place I saw anybody messing around with Soul Herder Ephemerate was uh, on the Nassif stream. I think I was even watching a lot of those early streams just mind being blown by how cool the deck was did you pick it up around then mm, not immediately you know i was messing around with some other stuff but there was a uh, there was some time after that where i was messing around with a jeskai version and a four color version that was playing avalanche riders and i was calling it soul rider and then right when uh ikora came out I like just day one. I had an eighty card Soul Rider deck with Yorion as the comp- as the companion, um, and that deck was really really good in that meta game. And then Nasif liked the deck a lot. And then Nasif got second on the very first challenge uh, with with my uh, Soul Rider list. Uh, so he, he and I have you know bounced lists back and forth uh, for a while. He definitely like really really likes the archetype, and I've uh, had a, a couple of drafts based on you know his inspiration mainly the avalanche rider lists and then now i totally forgot about right the list. avalanche rider deck that deck was beautiful i remember yeah i agree yeah from its inception it never really reached tier one status top mm-hmm. top dog that you had to really be aware of and prepare for but it did really cling to a lot of people's hearts and minds and has kind of always existed at least on the fringes for a long time, it was a mainstay of the 5-0 deck dumps um, that MTGO prints. Um, and really, since the printing of Modern Horizons, it's only received a handful of cards that may be considered new includes or upgrades. Yorion being one of them, which makes the deck bigger, but also gives you this new avenue to capitalize on all the powerful ETB triggers that you have access to. Stan, if there's one thing we've learned about modern and uh, apparently even lesser powered formats like historic and even standard is that there's always enough cards to make an 80 card deck. (laughs) You're not punished that much for an 80 card deck. I think the most recent addition that the deck gained is probably Skyclave Apparition. Is that card okay? I don't. I mean, is that a good card? That card's great. It's really, really good. Yeah, this deck is full of all the good white cards that everybody likes to pretend like doesn't exist when they're complaining. Yeah, I feel like after coming off of the Merfolk episode, we don't necessarily have this very clean, storied narrative path of cards being printed and evolving the archetype since this deck first emerged. This is like a very interesting contrast in that way, right? Like Merfolk is literally like one of the OG decks of modern of all time. And I would say Bant Ephemerate is one of the decks that only became a thing when we when we had the card Ephemerate even existed to in existence. Well, I don't know if that's exactly true. I, I think that uh, maybe the first iterations of decks like this would be like the Bant Eternal Command lists with uh, Aether Vial, Cryptic Command, Eternal Witness. I would say that that deck was in a very similar mm-hmm. vein as this one. Uh, so so maybe you could look, look at the history there because when I was initially building this list, it started because I actually uh, was working on it. This was before Skyclave came out, but I was just working on like an eternal command list, seeing if how good it felt. And it didn't feel very good, but it's kind of where the idea stemmed from. That's a fair point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think this is one of those things where like people have been making comes into play or enter the battlefield based decks like trigger based decks for a long time right and it's like what's the best enabler to make that work because there are really really powerful cards in modern for it notably eternal witness there's there's other ones as well but you know anyone that says when this comes into play draw a card or when this comes to play cast regrowth <laughs> there you know people are going to look for ways to abuse those things and and um this is just the latest in that shell but i guess one question before we hop into like the anatomy of the deck uh ever is what what inspired you to kind of what inspires you to keep coming back to this shell? Well, um, a few different things. You know, I like we kind of touched on briefly. My initial you know endeavors into these in this shell was you know the Nassif, mm-hmm. the old Nasif decks, and the more and more I played them, the more and more I realized boy, with so much card advantage, with so, with the ability to maneuver around your opponent's spells with ephemerate. 
it would be great if we could play controlling cards like Cryptic Command and Force of Negation, Path to Exile, and use those cards to slow the game down while we overwhelm our opponent with card advantage. And I was thinking about this for a long time, and it eventually became clear that in order to make that happen, we had to cut Soul Herder. Um, and where Ephemerate was always the more powerful effect than Soul Herder, and Soul Herder, there, there's there's a few, there's there's a kind of a lot to this, and I I know that uh, we kind of want to get to it later, but it kind of feels like a good time to get to it now. <laughs> so I think I'm just gonna talk about it. Please. Uh, you know, Soul Herder is a three mana sorcery speed one one that is incredibly fragile to instant speed removal, while Ephemerate is a one mana spell that is good against instant instant speed removal because you can play around it. You can even fizzle it with by casting the spell. And Ephemerate is the more powerful card. And because Ephemerate is the more powerful card and it's such a such a good card, you actually need less support for it for it to be ah. good because it's so strong by itself. While Soul Herder is not a super strong card on its own right. Uh, and so that to play Soul Herder, you really can't afford to play many non-creature, non-Ephemerate mm -hmm. spells. Your, your deck has to be like, 30 plus creatures for soul herder to be a playable card and so by cutting soul herders your ephemerates are still going to be incredibly powerful and you can afford to play your cryptics and your counter spells and your paths so that was the that was the first idea and then I, w I i had a few lists and i was trying to get it to work and then as i was working on it they printed skyclave apparition which is the perfect card uh, for the deck just a a efficient hyper efficient removal spell that works with ephemerate was exactly what the what the deck needed to to exist and so right after zendikar rising came out i had a, a good working first draft and i tuned it a bunch and then i got second place on back-to-back -back challenges with it and um and now uro is banned and now the deck is is different i think it's still fine i think it's still playable but uro has definitely left a big hole yeah in the deck oh. All right. Well, I think that since we brought up the namesake card of the deck and talked a little bit about why it's so powerful, I should just read it really quickly for people who haven't played it very much. So Ephemerate is from Modern Horizons, as we mentioned. It costs a single white mana. It's an instant, and it says, exile target creature you control, then return it to the battlefield under its opponent uh, under its owner's control. And it has Rebound. Now, Rebound is... A heck of an ability yeah. that's appeared in a couple of different sets. It was in Dragons of Tarkir. It was a Jeskai ability in Dragons of Tarkir. And then it was also, it got its premiere in uh, Rise of the Eldrazi. And what it says is, if you cast a spell from your hand, exile it as it resolves. At the beginning of your next upkeep, you may cast this card from exile without paying its mana costs. So you get to do it twice. Rebounds is uh, an ability I think a lot of people have had their eyes on for a little while, but there aren't very many rebound spells that are any good that cost one mana. Yeah. And so this one doing that is quite notable. Yeah, this to me is, I mean, this hits all of the things we look for in modern power level cards, right? It's a single mana. It is an instant single mana at that. It has rebound which is not something like we would typically look for but this is just even more value where it's like hey not only do you get a single mana spell you get it twice and it's a may ability and so it, it's just all these things fit into the not so secret sauce of why ephemerate has playability in a deck like this right like do you think even ever like would you play this even as sorcery like would that matter uh Probably not. Yeah. I don't know. It's hard to evaluate. It, it would be a, a powerful card still at, at sorcery, but you do lose a lot of flexibility from it. I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah. But I mean, maybe you just plus to fairy time raveler, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's true. what I'm talking about. That's my favorite yeah. synergy. Yeah. I do think one of one of the secret modes of this card. I think when I found when I was playing in this, and we'll talk about it later, is just using it as a counter spell that gets you a good trigger later. Because there, of course, this has the this has this card does have two problems one is you have to have a creature to target with it 
and sometimes in a spell heavy deck you draw this into a board state where you really are more of a control deck because your hand is full of spells and so that can be a little awkward or a little bit of a bummer sometimes and then the other thing is you have to successfully have the spell resolve on the creature that you target with it in order to get the rebound and so you are a little susceptible to instant speed removal once you've cast it so you do get into these game states you know that that's not a hard. I mean, that's not an uncommon thing in Magic. There's lots of cards that we play anyway, even though creature removal makes it harder. But you do get into this. The instant speed lets you play this in response to people's removal instead of having to be proactive with it all the time, which I think actually makes it uh, a lot, a lot more useful for sure. And that was part of the most int- one of the most interesting things I found about playing the deck for the first time was that aspect of like playing the counterspell kind of chicken, where you're like waiting waiting okay john are you gonna lightning bolt my skyclave apparition to try to get your token or what's gonna happen well i'm just gonna blink it and give you your token and i get to exile something else so and then a lot of times you'll have people casting their removal at sorcery speed while you're tapped out afraid of ephemerate and then that allows you to untap play a value creature ephemerate it and then you know get, get the value immediately yep. yeah i mean listen i love deconstructing this card but i think the level one needs to be said this is the most important card in the deck and it it's the glue that holds it together and the deck just wouldn't exist without it i don't think this deck would be as as popular or successful when it is successful if all we had was soul herder to to try to do like Mm -hmm. the ephemerate impression um ultimately this is the card that enables a lot of your mid to late game engine and can set up powerful win conditions. It draws you cards thanks to the creatures that we're going to talk about. Um, but not only does it generate a bunch of card advantage thanks to those creatures, but with the addition of Eternal Witness, which we'll get into, it gives you a lot of great card selection as well. Um, and sometimes I just feel like this was a one mana uh, draw three, uh, if not more, ultimately. Um in some cases, it even lets you go infinite. Yes, that's excellent. It's funny. A lot of times when I played this, though, it just felt it felt a little bit like light up the stage to me in a weird way, where it was kind of like, okay, I have my stuff, I enabled it, now I get to get my one mana payoff. So how are we enabling it? What are we What are we bouncing with this? Yeah, what are we bouncing? Let's start with Eternal Witness because maybe the most important creature in this deck um, or tied for for first one gg human shaman when it enters the battlefield you may return target card from your graveyard to your hand and it's a two one i want to talk before we talk about eternal witness in this deck i was thinking about going into this episode and just being like eternal witness is so good and has been so good at certain points in modern's history what is it about eat wit that has turned it into what it is right now, which is just being a fringe player, I think, in modern. Is it the fact that it just, like, one GG is just too hard to do? Like, three CMC is just not doing enough anymore, um, even with its incredibly powerful ETB ability? Well, it's a combination of all those things. It's it's also being a three-mana, one-toughness creature is really, really easy uh, to exploit, um, and and, and you, the, the mana is also a really, really big factor. Uh, Bant is a color combination that does not have a triome and is looking to cast a blue-green spell on turn two, a white-white colorless spell on turn three, green-green colorless, blue-white one, and then also triple-blue with cryptic on turn three. And I do think that, the, that, that this mana base is functional, but I also think that this mana base is worse than Sultai, Teemer, uh most other yeah, like color the, decks. The, one of the most recent games I had, I, I I said to the to the other co-hosts in our channel is I was like, guys, I have three Ewits in my hand and I don't have double green mana. <laughs> Just like this yeah. is the the freaking worst. Yeah, yeah. We do have a triome. It's called Reflecting Pool. You just have mm. to work for it. I, I love that Reflecting Pool is playable yeah. in this deck. It's uh, it it's been it was fun to to see. I mean, Ewits awesome though and there's plenty of decks that have been trying to use it over the years in different ways um but this one just seems so perfect with ephemerate together yeah, it's 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 just the perfect combo with ephemerate just being able to loop it every single turn yeah yeah right. so ex- with ex- ephemerate, explain that explain the loop like that's really what this card is doing is a mm-hmm. couple different sort of loops and and recursion engines from the graveyard so uh Eternal Witness and Ephemerate, a splintered twin combo, if you will. Uh, when you target Eternal Witness with Ephemerate, you get to get back any card in your graveyard, you know, 
whatever is the best in any given situation. And then when it rebounds, you get to uh, flicker Eternal Witness and get the Ephemerate back to your hand. So that uh, immediately you get back whatever you want, and then, and then the next turn you get back Ephemerate, and you can just keep doing that again and again and again. And specifically, if you have access to a Time Warp, you can get back your Time Warp every single turn and take infinite turns, which... Um, is a really powerful aspect of this deck. Currently, uh, I'm only playing one copy of Time Warp. I have played more in the past, and I think that there are going to be some metagames and situations where you want to do so. Um, but having five mana sorceries in your deck does have diminishing returns, especially when you already have just so many grindy elements that you don't necessarily need to draw your five mana sorcery to win the game. Um, and if you ever have just two sitting in your hand, it can be so devastating. So... The first copy is definitely good to play, and then copies two, three, four have just diminishing returns. Yeah. Does it? Did it remind anybody else a little bit of playing with um, our recently banned friend, uh, Mystic Sanctuary? <laughs> when you got this oh, really yeah. going, we were kind of yeah. like, "Oh, I'm going to get back cryptic. Oh, I'm going to get back cryptic. Oh, I'm going to get back cryptic. Oh, now I have time warp. Now I'm just going to do that." I did die to clock. When I was oh, doing the loop God, one time, because yes. there is a lot of clicking you got to do right yeah. in order to do the Ewit time <laughs> ephemerate time warp loop right. And, but and even there, when you click works. always yes on some of those triggers, it just doesn't work. Always yeah. yes doesn't work on MTGO. Why not? Yeah, it's a different that's object. Definitely, that's definitely a problem with picking this deck up, and I I get asked this a lot about people just saying it's it's a it's it's a very very time consuming deck to play, uh, and I. I play very quickly, and so I've never really uh, found it to be that big of an issue. But if you f are find yourself to be a slow player and you want to pick up the deck, I would definitely recommend familiarizing yourself with the play patterns a bit before you just join a league. Yeah, or, you know, in my case, when I was, like, watching TV with my wife while I was trying to play this deck at the same time, and I was like, wait, this is no, bad. No, it never goes well. I need, to go never in, goes I need well. to go in another room. It's fine when I'm playing prowess. <laughs> <laughs> this deck I found is really hard to play on a touch screen and like you really want to play it with a mouse. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. All right. So Eternal Witness, all time great, does an insane thing for this deck with Infemorate. But let's talk about some of the other great creatures that are in this deck as well. Stan, you alluded to it. The other best, maybe 1A, 1B kind of best card in this deck, Ice Fang Kawaddle. Mm -hmm. Why don't you read it? I think you've cast a lot more of these than I have, Stan. Another Modern Horizons card. I, I'm starting to see a trend here. So it's uh, blue-green for a 1-1 one, one flying flash. When it enters, you draw a card. And then if you have at least three other snow permanents, including lands, it has death touch. Yeah. Great ephemerate target, of course, because this is just one of the other ways that you can draw a lot of cards. Although the rebound on Ice Fang can be a little awkward because it then resets its summoning sickness. So something to keep in mind. Although there is one trick where if uh, you have a rebounding ephemerate, but you don't have a creature in play, you can respond to the rebound trigger by playing an Ice Fang and then get your extra card draw. It's something that comes up a lot. Nice. That is good. That is something that I, I never quite thought about. But yeah, that makes sense. Jinkies. I feel like this card does a little bit of everything for the deck, except close out games quickly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 20 turn clock. What are you talking about? I've got I mean, if you're, if you're taking all the turns, what does it matter? <laughs> That's right. Uh, Blistering speed. On my Eternal Witness, attack with my Ice Fang, cast Time Warp, <laughs> flip, bounce. Yeah. This is the most fun I ever had playing Ice Fan Quad, although I have to say, like, I've played it in a bunch of decks, but this is a good, a good, uh, a good place for it as well, where it doesn't feel too insane. The weirdest thing about this, I will say really quickly, the weirdest thing about Ice Fang to me in this deck was I often did not want to use it when it had Death Touch as a to kill a creature. I usually just wanted to get it on the board and then ephemerate it a bunch of times and draw, yeah. the, draw the cards, you know? Yeah, I, I, I want to put a, Pin it. I'm not saying we should kick that down the road, but I want to put a pin in that because I really uh, ever I really would love to hear your insight on like how do you think about these cards because this definitely feels like a maximizing value of your cards type deck, and like do you mm -hmm. see Ice Fang as like a as a death touching blocker? Do you see it as a single card uh, you know cantrip? Do you see it as a as a value engine, or does it really depend on the texture of the game? Yeah, it, it's it's absolutely the texture of the game. Uh, Sky Cl or Ice Fang is a super versatile card in this deck, and so it's going to fill different roles in different games. 
We've already touched on it a bit, but the win condition of this control deck is mostly just overwhelming card advantage. And, you know, you're getting a two for one with your Ice Fang, blocking sometimes, two for one with your Skyclave, and you're just going to overwhelm them completely. And, and sometimes you're going to need the sky, the Ice Fang in play to flicker with the Fim Rate, and sometimes you're thrilled to get your two for one, and it's just going to depend on the, the context of the game. And you're going to be, you're going to need to be willing to, to pivot on, on that. Speaking of Skyclave Apparition, one dub dub for a core spirit, it's a 2 2. When it enters, you may exile up to one target non land, non token permanent that you do not control with CMC 4 or less. And then when it leaves the battlefield, the exiled card's owner creates an XX blue illusion creature token, where X is the CMC of the cost, is the X is the CMC of the exiled card. I think they call it mana. I think they call it mana value now, Stan. Yeah, and what do they call the tallest building in Chicago over on Wacker and Congress? Uh, the Sears Tower. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, you know me. Never heard of the Willis Tower. This card, we know this card is amazing, good, great, super versatile, lets you get rid of something and then lets you get rid of something again later with Ephemerate. Mm-hmm. You know, blinking it with Ephemerate is a little awkward because they do get that body back and you can't clean up the token with said Skyclave. Yeah. But just a couple of things to note on that, a couple of tricks for the deck. You are you are right, uh, but you can respond to the Skyclave ETB with Ephemerate uh, to get uh, to to basically negate the first uh, token. So it, it works like the old, uh, fiend, the old hunter fiend Hunter trick. and not like uh, Deputy of Detention where if you sacrifice the skyclave or flicker it they won't get that first token uh, that trigger will will just not happen and then another thing to note is that wall of omens and safari time raveler are both really good at just ignoring your opponent's illusion tokens. Totally. i will say i did have a couple of games where i the only interaction i had was like skyclave and three ephemerates and i was like okay i'll just get rid of your guy and i was like i'll just get rid of your guy and i'll, I'll just do it again and mm-hmm. then i was like oh wait i turned your your i turned your dryad into a three three and i turned this into a, i turned azusa into a three three and then i'm like oh i'm gonna die to tokens actually yeah, that can absolutely yeah, that, yeah. that definitely is what my experience with elves was which is mm-hmm. just like mm. i have to get i i like blinked three or four of their valuable elves but at in the end they had Two two and three three tokens that just beat me down because I wasn't able to remove the individual pieces in the end. Yeah, so it it is a hard interaction or a hard t- thing to keep in mind based on the way that this deck deck plays out versus other decks with Skyclave Apparition in them. But that still doesn't mean that I didn't feel amazing playing a Skyclave Apparition and taking someone's uh, like taking someone's uh like expedition map played off curve and then when they played karn being like i'm gonna flip my skyclave apparition and just take your karn the great uh the great creator and that so like getting rid of problematic stuff two or three times with this card is still gonna be worth it way more often just be careful with the whole token thing and that's another reason to like seriously consider not sideboarding out something like wall of omens if you're not playing against an aggro deck you know like if you think that you're going to end up making a lot of tokens you're probably still going to need those walls because you're going to need to block and uh, and of course like Everett said it's another reason that um teferi is super good we did mention wall of omens two mana oh four defender when it etbs you draw a card a great way to use that ephemerate rebound i think if you have if you don't have Ewit, but you want to swing with your Ice Fangs or something, this is one of the ways that your Ephemerate basically turns into Ancestral Recall. And then a couple more specialist ones, or at least one more. Quick question about Wall of Omens. Everett, is there a reason that you didn't put Wall of Blossoms instead? And the reason I ask is because I would think you'd want to reduce your resil- reliance on white and have more reasons to... like fetch for green mana so that your ewits are easier to cast later but maybe well, the, you had the pro- a, a the, thought process the problem is uh you know skyclave is something you're wanting to cast on turn three really often eternal witness is not usually a turn three play mm-hmm. um and so i think you're more likely to want to have white early than green i think it's very very close i think that playing wall of omens versus wall of blossoms is a decision that doesn't matter a ton uh, but I think the kind of the tiebreaker is that Wall of Omens blocks a Stoneforge Mystic with a Sword of Feast and Famine, 
while Wall of Blossoms doesn't. Um, wow. And I think that that is pretty relevant right now, but ultimately it doesn't matter that much. What a call, though, about the, the, stone, uh, the Stoneforge. Yeah, and, and Shane, Dave, in case you didn't know, Wall of Blossoms, it's, it's just a color-shifted Wall of Omens. It's in green. I would say that that Wall of Omens is a color-shifted Wall of Blossoms, considering that Wall of Blossoms was in Tempest? Or was it in Stronghold? <laughs> It was in one of those sets, so um, no one knows. I love Wall of Blossoms. Hey, we can't Reminds me know. of the past. <clears throat> anyway, All right, let, last creature uh, in our blink suite, and that's Venser Shaper Savant, which is two UU for a two two flash legendary human wizard. When Venser enters the battlefield, you may return target spell or permanent to its owner's hand. So it's kind of like remand on a stick. Except instead of drawing you a card, it puts a body on the battlefield. Yeah, you know, as infrequently as this card sees modern play, this wasn't included in those early Nassif lists, too. So I think it's kind of a soul herder mainstay, even though it's usually just a one or two of because it is four mana. I like it. Gets blockers out of the way sometimes in the late game and potentially delay other important spells that opponents cast. Sometimes you can turn it sideways. Yeah, the, uh, the big mana matchups are usually pretty difficult, and Vincer is your best card in those matchups, so having access to, to it game one is really important, and then I usually play a second copy of the sideboard to mm. uh, hedge against those matchups too. Can you can you help me understand a little bit why it's really good in the big mana matchups? Because it's definitely... I I didn't sideboard it in in those mm-hmm. those matchups, and I understand... I understand what I, I just would like to hear a little more about what you're saying so I can learn. Yeah, yeah, my mistake. absolutely. I mean, <laughs> Vincer fights both primeval Titans, Karn, Karn liberated and the lands that enable them mm-hmm. where, uh, if you're a bit behind, you can just have them tap out for their six, seven minute play, bounce it back to their hand. And then if you have ephemerate, you can start to bounce their lands and then stop them from being able to, uh, replay their cards and then if you have eternal witness you're bouncing a land every turn and if these lands are tapping for two ma- two three mana being either bounce lands in amulet titan or tron lands you're going to restrict their mana and lock them out of the game with Vincer. wow big thing that i did not remember there is that Vencer bounces lands <laughs> good point Seems good. yeah great i will remember that next time all right, so those are the creatures. Surprise, this is also a control deck. We're not going to go through them in great detail, but the list that we played and ever designed, it's got three Force of Negation, three Cryptic Command, two Remand, two Path to Exile, and one Logic Knot, and this is all in the main deck. Just a nice suite of cards, buy you time, keeps your opponents from applying early pressure potentially. In some cases, they also draw you additional cards thanks to Remand and Cryptic is is force how good is force right now in the in the meta and modern do you think ever i'd say that it's good it's not as good as it's ever been it's the most important card in a lot of matchups like specifically mono green tron Mm -hmm. uh very very important against uh blue white x mirror matches because just forcing to fairy time raveler is is so important uh but it's 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 not very good against a lot of creature decks but I think it's still a card that you still want to be playing two or three copies in the main deck of most of your, your blue decks. Yeah, Teferi Time Reveler shuts down the rebound on your mm-hmm. Ephemerate, so it's a must-answer card if you're Absolutely. leaning into the Ephemerate plane. Yeah, one thing, I, before we talk about kind of like what this game, how the game plan is informed by this suite of sort of interactive and counter magic spells. You were kind of getting at this earlier, Dave, and then ever, uh, I think you kind of acknowledged it is look at the, the mana requirements of these cards, right? Like logic, not is a double blue cryptic command. It's triple blue uh, path as a single white force of negation. If you want to cast it as a cancel, which you don't typically do, but it, that's a double blue as well. Like, this is one of the strains I felt on this deck, along with things like the double white of uh, Skycleave Apparition and the double green of Eternal Witness. And we have these double blue and even triple blue pips of the of the counter magic. And that was definitely a stress that I felt on this deck. And so I guess the question that I want to ask you, Everett, in you know, as as a as an end to all of that preamble is what are you, how are you looking 
to 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 use these spells in the deck like are you using are you looking at a source of negation as as a as a potential cancel are you looking at path to exile as just like a as a optional interactive spell or are you saying like i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna mulligan to these cards in games two and game three and game one i'm gonna keep the best sort of flexible opener i can well this is this like most control decks your, your games are very flexible, and the cards that you have are very flexible. So there aren't a ton of hard and fast rules um, as far as how each card is going to act in each, in each game because all of them are very, very flexible. Uh, one thing is that you'll note we don't really have any one-drops. I basically never cast Path to Exile on turn one. So you are almost always going to be fetching a dual land on turn one, and then ideally a complementary basic land on turn two. So what you want to do on turn one most of the time is get Glacial Floodplain into basic forest or potentially you'll get Temple Garden into basic island. You will very rarely get Breeding Pool plus basic planes um, because that can't cast Ice Fang, although it, it does happen sometimes depending on, on what your hand looks like. Um, so that's that's something you want to be thinking about when you are are sequence, uh, sequencing, and uh, also if your hand doesn't have Eternal Witness in it, your mana gets a bit better because Eternal Witness is a late game card, and everything else is something that you want to be playing in the early and mid game. And so if you don't need to play Eternal Witness on turn three to get back your fetch land to hit your fourth land drop, you can afford to not get that second green until like turn five, turn six. Question for my co-hosts. How much did you guys wish you had that fetching heuristic when you did your leagues? Because I I wasn't thinking about my lands in quite those terms. I don't think I made any obvious stupid mistakes per se, but like that was, you know, the way ever laid that out was very elegant. And I don't know if I had that line of thinking. I'll just say in my disposal. I'll just say I felt pretty proud when he was describing that because I loved grabbing turn one glacial floodplain in this deck. Yeah, that was dope. I was like, this card is great here. It's going to help me turn this on. I don't care about casting one drops ever. Like Mm -hmm. this is, this is great. So I, I was glad, I was glad to see that card in the deck just because I, I felt like those cards were going to pop up occasionally. And, um, and it just made a lot of sense to me. I think the, um, the harder part for me was when we got to like, how, how soon can I get cryptic command online? That's where things got complicated where I was like, okay, did I fetch right? So I'm going to have three blue on turn four or did I mess that up on turn three? Basically, did right. I fetch the wrong thing on turn three? Cause I did that a few times where I was like, uh, I'll get, I guess I'll get a temple garden and it's like, Oh yeah, I did not want a temple garden there. Yeah. I, I feel like I definitely made mistakes in overvaluing snow basics over having more duels where it's like, well, h- how much do I really care that, uh, ice fang quaddle, has the snow support and maybe I should really more highly value having a a more broad mana base right now and the ability to use my double pips when I can. And I think that's definitely something I did wrong. And and I think that usually you want to prioritize better mana over ice Fang being death touch in this deck. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say that goes back to my earlier question where I was kind of like, I felt like I didn't want to, even cash it in to block stuff when I was taking damage all that often, because I would rather be able to draw off of the ice Fang again, uh, at least the first time. So um, I think that that's another reason to not worry about having snow basics too much is if, if you're playing it that way. I think we're, right, we're going to talk about the mana in a second, but I, I do want to talk about these control spells because these integrate with the what the rest of the deck is doing, I think, in an interesting way. And because you, your experience playing this deck, Spike, what are you looking to do with these spells and when? Because Cryptic Command is one of those interesting spells where it's like, you know, it can generate such long game value. Is it a four drop or is it a like, you know, nine drop? Shane. <laughs> what did I do wrong? Can, uh, yeah, you didn't do anything wrong. But this is this is like an interesting conversation because you're not. How many decks have you played in the last year that had Cryptic Command in them? Oh, like zero, right? So or remand. So it's super interesting to hear because the, I think the point with with this is like there is no way to play to play Cryptic Command the same way every time. Sure, you know what I mean. Like it's one of those cards that has so many different tools. So it is interesting 
because I, I'm just realizing we haven't talked to you about a deck that had counter spells in it, like that you played no, in play a really spells. long time. Um, it's hard, I, I think, to think about it that way. But I think that the big part here is like, and ever intimated this a little bit earlier, is like force negation is big to help you with stuff like Tron because of the enablers, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crypt, Cryptic Command is going to help you with card advantage and also to control your opponent's board here and there. And occasionally you'll probably pick up a permanent of your own with it to be able to recast. Sometimes if you need Skyclave Apparition or something like that and you don't have Ephemerate. And Remand is is there to help you against some of those big decks again to be able to to draw a card just buy you a turn until you're better set up to deal with the threat that they have later but it's really like you don't you're right to ask the question about like do i play cryptic command on curve and the answer is you hope you don't have to in some ways but you need to be ready to is kind of the way to think about about it i think because you don't really want to cast cryptic command on turn four you'd like to have other stuff that's available to do um but it's nice to have if you have to do it yeah i mean the reason i asked that question i guess i guess it reveals my gap of knowledge that i think many players probably share which is like how do you play a control deck in modern especially one that is not ostensibly a pure control deck and that's kind of what that's kind of what i'm getting at well, I think what's going to maybe open your third eye here, Shane, is if you stop looking at these creatures like they're creatures. It's <gasps> a good and point. And you start looking at them like they are instants and sorceries because they are. What? Um, all of these cards, uh, you know, Ice Fang is a, you know, terminate draw a card. And Wall of Omens is as well against creatures that it can block. And Eternal Witness is, you know, your late game tidings or, you know your card advantage spell. Skyclave Apparition is your detention sphere. And so it's not like Cryptic Command and Ephemerate, Logic Knot, Path to Exile are so drastically different from the creatures in this deck because all the creatures answer your opponent's permanence as well. Um, and so just like a traditional control deck, your whole deck is full of answers and card advantage. And eventually you will run your opponent out of uh, threats and you'll overwhelm them with your card advantage. Dang. You're all wrong. You use the remand to uh, remand your own spells back and, and yeah, sometimes grow your storm count. Okay. Yeah, Can't, exactly. Okay, hold on. B before we move on, this is again <laughs> revealing my ignorance. Okay, can we talk about? I want to talk about remand in thirty seconds or less. In terms of when, when, and why do you play a remand? Right. Like I feel like in a, I feel like remand. I I look at remand as a combo decks counter spell. Because you want to buy yourself one turn, but I mean that is one way to look at it. But clearly, it, I sure. am wrong because yeah. this yeah. is not a combo deck necessarily. But when you're when the rest of your deck is full of answers, a remand can trade up on mana, draw you a card, and your deck is full of answers to answer the threat on the next turn. Yeah, it, it, it also you play it early to keep the game going longer, and then you play it late so you can tap out for a three drop mm -hmm. and hold up some interaction too until you can actually like untap again. And when you compare it to Mana Leak, I, and it's possible you wouldn't be playing Mana Leaks instead. Um, but when you compare it to Mana Leak, this deck wants to go until turn 20 and keep drawing cards and grindy. And Remand never becomes dead yeah. while Mana Leak does. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're looping Path to Exile with Eternal Witness. And what is Control if not a combo deck? Where the combo mm -hmm. is, I have all the answers to all of your spells. And you have no answers. Okay. I love it. I Shane... This is, I, I really want to come back to this sometime and just spend an entire episode talking about how to cast counter spells just yeah. because I think there's a lot there. Shane's blue boot camp. Yeah, blue camp, we could call if it. You can counter the spell, counter the spell. That's all you have to know. Every time you can, do it. You know, I don't think we can talk about the controlness of this deck without at least mentioning three Teferi Time Raveler, one Teferi Hero Dominaria, and most important of all, that. Both of these cards are actually the same character from the Magic the Gathering story. Whoa. And, the, and he's wearing the same my outfit, which is... Uh, mm -hmm. My third eye is open even, even yeah. wider. Even more. These cards are... Well, I, mean, I mean, Teferi Time yeah. Raveler is huge in this deck. Like, that's, that's it. That's like the bottom line. Well, I, I was really impressed with Hero, too. Sure. Because Hero was kind of the way that you get to your win con which is probably like super a super obvious way to describe it in a control strategy. But once you get to ferry big to ferry down, you kind of have gained control of the game, and it's just yours to win at that point. 
And very notably, Teferi Hero of Dominaria is your out to infinite life against Heliod combo. I think that mm -hmm. every control deck needs to be playing an out to infinite life. So when your opponent just turn threes you, you uh, don't have to say, oh, I, I lose. You actually have a way to keep playing and win the game. You have to explain it to them in chat, though, because they do get some. I right, need right. to so, understand that. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. so maybe it's not super obvious, but for those of us who play Dominaria standard, it is. Uh, Teferi, Hero of Dominaria, can beat infinite life in sort of a convoluted way. First, you, you plus, and then you get Teferi to nine loyalty, and then you ultimate it, and then you simply exile all of your opponent's permanents. And then... To fairy hero of dominaria can minus three targeting itself over and over again so that you never deck right so you draw a card you exile your opponent's land or whatever their permanent is and then you cannot deck because to fairy is always going to be able to put himself on top of your library and your opponent is going to deck before you do that so I do, Teferi is a way to beat into the life. I do yeah. remember that from from Dominaria now because people were mm -hmm. using that to just like win through decking, right? They would just loop your Teferi. Yeah, it was it was the best win condition. I mean, Teferi Hero of Dominaria being the best win condition and the best card advantage engine in those standards and even in modern control decks now is a really really important thing. Great point. Let's talk about the mana real quick. Twenty four lands. Only eight of which are snow, including one glacial flood plain, which is the Asorius Snowland. You know, your Snowlands enable Death Touch on Ice Fang. You only have one Prismatic Vista in this list, which felt a little atypical for what we've come to learn to expect from snow decks specifically, though you do have nine other traditional fetches. Also one Reflecting Pool, which is your Bant Triome in this deck as early as turn three. Prairie Stream, which is basically Tundra once you get two basics out. And then you have your Bant Color Shocks to round it out. And my question for Everett, can you offer insights or, or heuristics even? You know, you talked about your turn one and turn two fetches, but how you built this mana base. You know, how considering how greedy it is and how much heavy lifting it does to support Cryptic and Ewit and Skyclave, how do you decide how many reflecting pools versus how many basics, etc.? Yeah, I can talk about that. Uh, one thing to note is when you say that there are only eight snowlands, I think that's not true. There's 18 snowlands. We have 10 fetch lands in the deck. Uh, so 18 out of our 24 lands, our, our snow is how, at least at least how I look at it. Um, as far as speaking to the Prismatic Vista and the Reflecting Pool, I think those are two very interesting cases where... Both Prismatic Vista and Reflecting Pool are cards where you're usually very happy to draw the first copy. The first copy is usually going to help you develop your mana in a really good and meaningful way. And both of them have diminishing returns, where if you draw the second Vista, all of a, where, where usually you really want to get dual land plus basic land, and your two fetches were both Vista, that's, always, that's going to be a big problem a lot of the time. Or uh, if you just have two Reflecting Pools... It's your man is not going to develop well, but if you only play one copy of each of these cards, you're never going to have the problem of drawing two of each. And so I've been, I have been loving one copy of Reflecting Pool and John and Jeskai and Sultai Teamer decks, and I, I, I really do think that, especially in decks with Triumphs, you're going to see more and more of that. Just one Reflecting Pool, um, and Reflecting Pool does help you with the double green, double blue, double white spells in the stack. Uh, in a really meaningful way. Um, as, as far as the rest of it goes, uh, you know, you're you're a 24 land deck in modern. I think that's the number of lands you want to play in this list with all of the, with the eight can tripping two drops. Um, and with Ice Fang, I don't think that you can afford to play any utility lands like a castle or a colonnade. And so I do think that one snow dual land is worth it to enable Ice Fang. I think Glacial Floodplain is the best one because you don't want you don't want the blue green one because if you get the blue green dual land, you're incentivized to fetch basic planes, which doesn't let you cast Ice Fang. Um, so you want either the blue-white one or the green-white one. And I think that the blue-white one is better because of both Skyclave and Cryptic Command, which are which are harder to cast than Eternal Witness because Eternal Witness is really a turn 5, turn 6 play. Mm. It's Eternal Witness is your late-game card advantage spell. I kind of group it with Teferi Hero of Dominaria as like your late-game power engines. Um, and so... and. I, 
I, I wanted about six, seven basics to go with Ice Fang and also just to have lands to play untapped as I try to hit all my land drops in the late game. Um, and at that point, just the rest of the, the fetch shock mana base, I feel like filled itself out. Yeah, it's interesting. That point about the green white versus blue white uh, snow duel, it's funny because at the same time when I was fetching with the stack, I almost never wanted Temple Garden, you know, and so mm-hmm. you can see really fast, like why you don't want the green white duel. Yeah, there, there are some hands where you want Temple Garden basic island, uh, but it's way less common than Glacial Floodplain basic forest. Mm-hmm. But that's usually how you want things to develop is tap dual land, untap basic land. Yeah. All right, last card. We have to talk about it, and that's Time Warp. Everett, you alluded to it earlier. Mm -hmm. It's a five mana, three blue, blue sorcery. Target player takes an extra turn after this one. Simple, clean, you know what it does. Gets you an extra turn. This card does not exile itself, like Temporal Mastery. It doesn't even have any other drawbacks, like Savor the Moment, which makes you skip your untap step. You know, we're only running one copy because it is a five mana sorcery. So we're not really all in on a combo with this deck, but what a combo it is. With a single Eternal Witness and a single Ephemerate, you can take infinite turns with Time Warp. It's important to have this. It's a good thing to, to have access to in a, in a field that has stuff that does infinite life, you know? And so I think you, you, if, even if they do that, like Everett said, I mean, you can draw your way all the way to your Teferi and then win with Teferi. You can, against decks that are sort of just unfair, you can go a slightly unfair line. You're not guaranteed to draw it, of course, and there's not a way to search it up, but you do draw a lot of cards at this deck. And so you're probably going to be able to get to it in the situations that you want it from having a one of. Did either of you guys ever pull it off in our testing? No. I did. Yeah, me too. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like I said, I, I did it. So the, the wild thing is I did it against Tron, weirdly, and I clocked I clocked myself doing it. Yeah. Like Tron was so far ahead of me on clock that I was trying to get to my win conditions or get a board big enough, and I just, I didn't get there. I kept drawing lands and da 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 So, um, but I did get there. In paper, it would have worked. <laughs> yes. Um, but it's right. a great, I think it's a great, just like extra dimension mm-hmm. to this deck that you don't necessarily see coming with the creature value plan, but it makes a bunch of sense. It's the same way as like, you know, when four color Omnath was running time warp and you're like, why would it do that? And then you're like, oh, it makes a ton of sense in, in that deck to have that dimension sometimes as well. So, okay. So those are all the cards we, we played the deck to, uh, varying degrees of success, but to kick it off, I got to ask. Is this just like one of the most fun decks that we've played in a while? Shay okay, has thoughts. Okay, hold on. Okay, <laughs> I, 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 I will say it is a fun deck that you have to want to go into the double digit turns with. Like oh, yes. you, you definitely want to use your clock. Like you're, you're yes. going to be in the single digits left on your chess clock on Magic Online. I mean, it, it's super interesting to me because, again, now, like we talked about earlier, this is very not a Shane deck. And no. you and you played it oh, Christ. Like, a, like a champ. So it should be. You played so it, it should be because it's a decision deck. It's fun decisions. Okay, well, it's deck. a decisions deck. But, yeah, you, you have to want to, like, outvalue your opponents in a very particular type of value. And I think that that was a, an eye-opening experience. Again, like, like Spike mentioned earlier, my third eye was opened in terms of a different kind of value deck. Like, this, this is Bant value. This is not Jund value. This, this deck is kind of exhibit A in how to win with card advantage and bearing your opponent in cards. And, and 1-1 flying even when attackers. It, exactly, yeah. You know, the way I spelled it out, for the notes here is that when it takes a long time to close out games, the amount of internal synergies you have between, you know, a handful of two to three card interactions and the sheer amount of triggers that you generate, it always makes me feel like I'm doing a lot and things are happening, even though I'm just flickering creatures and drawing cards and taking 20 turns to actually win. Spike, you play, you play a lot of decks ever. And, and, what what makes modern fun for you? Like, is this like one of your top fun decks? Like, what 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 makes this deck uh, fun for you? I mean, fun is hard to quantify, and a big part of the enjoyment for me 
right now in my magic playing is brewing up a deck and having it be competitive and you know sharing it with my stream um but i i tend to enjoy decks that make a lot of decisions and this is definitely a deck that makes a lot of decisions and i tend to to find that to be fun um Although that's not, it's, it's not always true, you know? Like, I, I don't usually enjoy playing Urza decks, although I have been playing some lately. Uh, oh, no, why? We can talk about that later. <laughs> yeah, we, we can talk about that later, but... Uh, is there a certain land? Yeah, there is There is a certain land, Gingerbread Cabin. But, oh, yeah. But without, without you know, derailing this train, uh, fun is hard to quantify. I like decks that with a lot of different decisions, but uh, at, at least personally you know building the deck doing well with it in tournaments sharing with your chat seeing other people playing it that's that's where i derive the most fun right now Mm -hmm. so it's maybe not super relatable but it's it's honest i guess it makes a ton of sense i think if you were to think about like the psychographic profiles of the members of the dive down right we have the, the the iron triangle where I'm at one point and Shane's at one point and stands at the other point. This is like in the Stan Dave quadrant, mostly mm-hmm. shaded towards the Stan quadrant and not very much in the Shane quadrant. That's, that's how I would say. And, and it's, and it's a, tri- it's a triangle with, with quadrants. It'd be a well, tri, tridrants. Tridrants. Yeah. The tridrants. Yeah. But like that, that's how it, it feels to me is like, I had fun playing this deck, but while I was playing this deck, I was mostly thinking about how much fun Stan was probably have playing this deck. And guess what? Stan was texting us in Slack yes. going, he was like, oh, going, I was guys, so this much is fun. amazing. No, I love Lincoln things. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, this, this deck is, is so good. fun that even writing notes about it was like the most fun I've had all weekend. Oh, good. You wrote all the notes this week. So I appreciate it. The thing that really clicked for me while we were playing this was that I got to this point where I was just locking out my opponents in a way that, you know, playing traditional blue white controller or stone blade deck where you're just like playing counter spells and wraths and, and point removal, you don't lock them out that way. Like you keep the board clear with those control decks here. You're winning. Even if they have a board full of creatures, you just kind of don't care about them uh, because you're either taking infinite turns or flying over them or just maintaining control of the game state without necessarily maintaining control of the board state. Totally true. And the thing that I enjoyed the most with it, I think was having people feel a little unprepared for Mm -hmm. the amount of times you can answer permanence with this deck or different things that they were doing by just kind of like being heads up about it. And also I think there's a little bit of tension going on here too, where a lot of people didn't seem to have graveyard hate against me in the decks that they're playing or they won't bring it in against yeah. me and that of course makes eternal witness much worse um if people bring in something like that so uh, maybe it's not worth it to bring it against against me but i definitely felt like there weren't a lot of people who could interact with the ephemerate plan uh in any direct way to keep it from happening now i did play against some decks that i felt like ephemerate wasn't particularly good against like that just the game plan wasn't a great matchup for what they were doing but um you know, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute about individual matchups. But it was more often that the deck executed and it wasn't good enough than the deck failed to me. So it was fun that the deck mostly worked, I guess is what I'm trying to say, is that the plan works, <laughs> yes. you know. The plan works. Sideboarding was hard. And one of the questions, if, if I was to ask about sideboarding in a single way, do you ever side out ephemerate? Yeah, I, I, I will very often trim one, sometimes two, um, when I cut other creatures. So uh, usually any time, there are a lot of matchups where I'll cut like two or three wall of omens. There's a lot of matchups where I'll cut the vincer. There's a lot of matchups where I'll cut some skyclaves. And at that point, I don't feel like you have that critical mass or density and I'll, I'll be trimming on ephemerates. Um, so yes I, I think really the only cards that you'd never really cut are like ice fang and i there are some matchups where you trip to fairy time raveler actually so yeah it's it's really probably just ice fang is the only card that never ever gets trimmed on hmm. that's interesting because there's definitely decks where ice fang is like not that good right like it, are, are there i don't know i mean you, you might be right you might be right but it's just like 
It's just always just such an efficient two mana draw card. It's just like even when it gets lava darted, you've still drawn a card and gotten half of a card. I was mostly there. thinking about Tron, where it's like I mean, yeah, yeah it's yeah, like Tron. That's true. Tron. It doesn't really do anything against Tron, but it does draw you a bunch of cards. Yeah, it, you you are right. It's not good against Tron, but uh, your whole deck's also not good against Tron. <laughs> so you have to have to leave it in. This is something I wanted to ask you about. Was I have a lot of trouble with Green Tron with this deck. And I know Force of Negation is important. Like you said, Venter is good against it. But I, I think I lost a Tron. I did two leagues. I think I lost a Tron three times across the two leagues. And maybe that's just how it goes. Yeah, it's it's one of the worst matchups. It's definitely winnable. I know that you said you didn't bring in the second Venter. Right. But that, that is one of the most important cards in the matchup. Uh, you know, usually in that matchup, you're trying to establish Eternal Witness Ephemerate plus Counterspell mm-hmm. or Eternal Witness Ephemerate plus Time Warp, ideally. And I, I have been toying around with the idea of playing a second time warp in the sideboard for these kind of matchups because mm. it does feel like the infinite turns plan is the most important plan against the big mana deck. Yeah, I will say that having force and negation, of course, is like good against them so you can get their scrying mm. or their or their map Absolutely, or whatever. Yeah. And then the other thing is actually having I did manage to do Ephemerate Ewit Path to Exile against back to back Ulamog. The, the ceaseless <laughs> hunger which somehow oh, wow. worked because like they targeted my ewit then i flashed my ewit then i pathed it then they cast another one i did the same thing and it was like i won that game it was a struggle but i definitely felt like a champion after dealing with two ulamogs and not dying and not just losing out to the four cards that i lost so it still has some play against it i also had problems against amulet titan and i don't know if you feel like similarly that's a problematic matchup. I do, yes, yeah. I do. Because yes. I noticed there's four Aether Gusts in the sideboard, and mm-hmm. it's kind of like, okay, this is supposed to be a trump card against prime t- prime time. But the the problem that I had a couple of times was where I would draw into like a couple of Aether Gusts and Ephemerates and not have a creature to flip with it a bunch of times, and so I ended up just like buying a couple of turns with prime time but not being able to close it out. And that that was the one thing that was kind of like a bummer for me in that matchup where like you know I'm used to having Aether Gust be incredible against prime time because I'm on prowess, you know, or I'm like okay, I I get rid of your guy for one turn and then I hit you for seventeen. Like it, it, this deck does not close out fast as we've talked about a couple times. Yeah, I kind of wanted to sort of get to that which is like what do you do with this deck like how how do how are you looking to win with this deck against a large swath of the modern field like we're not talking about weird decks here we're not talking like green tron amulet titan i i had some problems with uh azorius control or um like sort of weird is it control type builds like like how how are you looking to primarily win with this deck or again is it one of those questions where it's like shane you idiot there is no primary way to do anything with this deck. It's all about being responsive to what the other player is doing. Well, this is the first time that I'll say there is a primary way to win with this deck, and it's very obvious. You win with overwhelming card advantage. (laughs) But but you're just drawing more cards. Yeah, it it doesn't matter. (laughs) I know that this is just like, this sounds like, you know, your FNM hero control player, right? But... That, that, that really is what this deck does. You you just two for one them into the ground. You run them out of resources. And then it doesn't matter. You have two twos. You have one ones. You have a Teferi Time Raveler. You have an infinite turns combo. Those are the actual ways your opponent loses the game. But really how you win is you just grind them into dust. Is this Jund? No. Jund doesn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> J- J- Jund is, yeah. Jund is, uh, is tempo value. It's about like finding the window in which you can win, like turns five, six, seven, eight, or something like that. Although, yeah, I mean, Jund really is, you know, play efficient threats that take over the game by themselves. And this deck doesn't. This deck plays a ton of two for ones. I see. You know, that just kind of sit and play after you get your value. So it, it is different from Jund. Um, but Jund does, you know, grind their opponents into dust sometimes. But this does take time as a result of that being the plan. And yes. so it is hard with those big mana decks, like you said, to like, you have to really be on your guard because it takes all it takes is one turn for them to like where you don't have the right answer or where you're kind of like missequence something and you don't have it right. And then suddenly they're just like, here's prime time. Here's this. At least I don't have feel the dead anymore, but I'm still going to hit you with, you know, for 12 or whatever with it and go on from there. And so, um, that was hard. I did have a lot more success. I feel like with, um, 
I'm trying to think of the types of decks that it was better against. It was kind of like the medium sized creaturey decks where I felt like I had the best play where it was kind of like, okay, I'm going to counter your spells and your enablers. And then I'm going to, I'm going to skyclave a couple of your creatures and turn them into worse creatures, even if skyclave goes away. And then eventually I just get to roll through with three skyclave apparitions and kill you. I felt like decks with burn spells were hard. Um, and that includes gut shot or not. I'm sorry, not gut shot grape shot. So like I was able to beat storm game two when they went into empty the warrens and I just went infinite with cryptic commands and just kept the board tap down. But grape shots just felt unbeatable lava spike and Eidolon of the rhetoric also just basically felt unbeatable. Um, because with the exception of a handful of Oriok champion, you don't really have significant life gain and Oriok I don't think is the trump card against burn as well as certain other life gaining cards can be. And that's the uh, the hole that Uro left, where those matchups used to be very easy because you had Uro to just you ephemerate your Uro and gain a ton of life. Um, and you no longer really have a access to something really powerful in the same vein as Uro. And I, I haven't played a ton of this deck since Uro got banned, and I do think that this deck is still playable and, and, and solid. Um, but I, I, I would like to have access to something like that in the main deck. And I, you know, the obvious options are like Knight of Autumn and Thrag Tusk, and neither of those cards I think you want in your main deck. And so you're not wrong. You're, in fact, you're absolutely right. Uh, the Ariok Champions in my sideboard are kind of, you know, the answer that I'm looking for, but I'm hoping to maybe discover something or. Maybe something gets printed uh, in the future that kind of solves that problem. But you you are right. The burn matchup is a lot worse than it used to be. I think it's still. I I I, I think these those matchups are still okay, um, especially post board when you get access to the Anthonice and the Ariac champions. But Anthonice. they used to be like just slam dunks, easy matchups. Anthonice, man. Long time coming for that card. It's been like 18 months since it's been printed, but I've seen a lot of places the last few weeks. And I think it's just nice to have extra, extra, extra paths, basically really effective. Now I, I love the card. Um, in fact, this is the only deck where I'm actually playing path to exile in the main deck over on nice and all my other ones. I'm playing on the nice in the main deck instead. The, the exception with this deck is that you can loop Path to Exile with Eternal Witness in the late game, which is very powerful. But in uh, you know decks without Eternal Witness, being able you know if you cast Path to Exile on a Monastery Swiss Spear on the first turn of the game, it, it feels like you're uh, you're putting yourself in a losing position. Um, and Monastery Swiss Spear decks are super duper uh, super duper powerful, super duper. Uh, popular in the format. So if you can just play Anthonice instead, I found myself uh, crushing the uh, Swift Spear decks. Um, I hate to ask us at this point, because I feel like we have like five, ten minutes left in this pod. Um, and I've kind of asked it earlier, but like, let's say, let's say you're me. Let's say, let's say you're Shane, right? And you're like, and, and you're not good with decks like this. And the, the concept of this deck's value generation engine is fairly foreign to you. What are the tenets of playing this deck that you would give to, you know, newbies to it to say like, here's how to think about playing this deck and, and try to succeed with it because it's not how you think about other decks that you've played. Well, I would try to advise you to any time you feel like you can exchange resources with your opponent where you end up ahead, take that exchange. Anytime you can, you know, profitably ephemerate to draw two cards, you should probably just take that. Anytime that you can, um, you know, just block with your Ice Fang and draw a card that's probably an exchange that favors you, uh, just try to have those two for ones and as many of them as possible. Uh, to get ahead and that that would be i think just kind of a very basic game plan to enact and then i promise you you'll find yourself winning the game on turn 20 if you just do that as many times as possible and then another one is probably the fetching thing that we talked about yes. that's that's kind of no you have to cast a blue and a green on turn two know that you're going to want to cast a two white pips on turn three probably and know you're probably going to cast three blue pips on turn four and try to try to make that happen you know so whatever you do to make that plan go is the the way to do it 
the other thing is one thing I would throw out there is if if you haven't played decks like this a lot, but you're still familiar with modern, using force and negation to take large non-interactive decks off of their early enabling plays is what the card is there for. And so, you know, aside from Storm, aside from things that are really degenerate, like, uh, like you know, Dredge, in my opinion, taking someone off of their chromatic sphere sometimes is fine. You know what I mean? Taking somebody off of their expedition map I've talked about a couple times is fine. That's what Force of Negation is here for. You don't have to save it for late in the game to, to protect something from a uh, removal spell. It's much more proactive than that. I'll tack on one, you know, mini level up I had while playing this deck. It felt like almost every matchup had a card that I can recycle with my Eternal Witness and an Ephemerate that would get me the advantage I need to eventually take control. So against something like Titan, I felt like Ewit plus Ephemerate plus Aethergust is unbeatable for the Titan player. Uh, sometimes it's Path. It, it can be counter spells as well. And I feel like one of the things that you can try to do in matchups if you're piloting this deck is figure out what do I want to play every turn thanks to my Ewit Ephemerate combo to essentially lock out my opponent and buy me as much time as I need to eventually win with my 1-1s. One yeah, I agree. I agree. We did it. We did another deck dive. I mean, I this deck this deck is fun, super interesting. We'll see what happens going forward, like where it grows, where it fits into the the meta. But um, just want to thank Bob for asking us to take a look at this deck, and Everett, thanks for coming on again to give Bob an extra special gift because he is our <laughs> boss, as I mentioned. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Anything for Bob? Bob is chairman of the board. Yeah, he but he he, he does give so much back to the community. He does. He does. Hey, Shane. Yes. Can you tell the listeners, where can they find Aspiring Spike? Okay. Twitch.tv. I believe it's forward slash Aspiring Spike. Also, Twitter.com. Is it Everett Mohan? Is it Mo- Mohan? It's Mohan Everett. Everett yeah. But I'll... Also, if you search Aspiring Spike, it'll come up. Was that because, was that because the other Everett Mohan had taken <laughs> Everett Ever Mohan? Or? Uh, you know what? I don't know why I... Did it like that. I, I didn't set up this account when I started streaming. I set up this account uh, for other magic <laughs> you know results before I was streaming. And I'd probably uh, do it differently if I could now. Uh, but but Not- yeah, like I, I love I love uh, your, your Twitch. It is it is pretty much the only Twitch I put on uh, during the day. The community is very chill, uh, very engaged, and the stream is always dope. So thanks for being there for me during this coronavirus pandemic, my friend. Yeah, thanks for giving me a, an outlet to talk all night instead of just... <laughs> being alone <laughs> watching <laughs> watching the latest uh stars yeah. tv yeah i i watch a lot of twitch streams uh you know late into the night waiting for my partner to get off work so i'm glad to be giving the opportunity to come on the dive down instead awesome well uh it's a, it's a rare rare occurrence you know mm-hmm. i've heard i heard a rumor i don't know if this is true but uh, is it true that you've seen every episode of queen's gambit I have yes, I uh, I'm well known for watching it from start to uh, start to finish. Oh, wow, I didn't know anybody <laughs> got through that show. <laughs> All right, that wraps up this week's episode. Thanks again to Bob. Of course, we couldn't do it without you. Uh, certainly wouldn't play this deck if it weren't for Bob's recommendation. And for that reason, I personally send you my love and gratitude because this is probably the best episode I ever got to be a part of. And of course. Uh, Ever thanks as always for for joining us. You know, basically always saying yes to us without ever having ulterior motives or condition or favors that we have to meet. Yeah, I'm just happy to be here. It's a good time. Everyone out there, if you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe to our podcast so you get the latest episodes as soon as they come out. And if you use Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and review. You can submit questions to the podcast or just pick in our brains on our favorite magic formats over on Twitter at the dive down, all one word. And you can email us the dive down at gmail.com. If you'd like to support the show, you can join our Patreon over at patreon.com slash the dive down. You can also support the show while playing magic with mana traders. If you sign up with coupon code, the dive down, all one word, 
you'll get 15% off your first three months of renting Magic Online cards. If you play Magic Arena, you can support the Dive Down without spending any money by using our affiliate link to download the free deck tracking software over at untapped.thedivedown.com. As always, special thanks to the bands Nowhere and Space Blood for letting us use their music. And until next week, get out there and e fam mer Ray!